Julie Bagman is a professor of landscape architecture at the University of Virginia's School of Landscape Architecture and is internationally recognized as an innovative designer in building regenerative and environmentally robust landscapes. She founded DIRT Studio, which stands for Dump It Right There, in 1992 to execute projects with a passion, rigor, vision, and unflinching honesty that are her hallmarks. Julie's work adheres to themes of economy of means, urban succession, community engagement, respect for, for the site's narratives, and a love in particular for the industrial and urban landscape. Julie's presentation is entitled Cyclical Landscapes, and she's going to join us from Virginia, USA. Hi, everyone. Um, I was super honored to be uh, invited to this. I also want to thank Streetscapes. I also want to do a shout out to uh, Jan Broadley, um, who has taken care of me. Um, you know, at some point she's so accommodating, I thought maybe she was going to carry me across the ocean there. Uh, kind of wish she had. But um, so anyway, here we are. Your first disruption is a, a lecture that is um, disembodied. So this is my home turf. This is where I grew up. So it's kind of no surprise that I'm interested in the landscapes that I am. Um, but I have to say that traveling in my family station wagon down the Jersey Turnpike, I loved the mess of refineries, the swamps, and the small towns. Obviously, this is a landscape of perpetual social, ecological, and environmental disruption. But for this talk, I do want to shift the term disruption um, to disturbance. Um, since disturbance, by its ecological definition, is wed with succession. Um, and it's a cyclical way of thinking that I think demands a different way of thinking. Next slide. Um, the entropic view of disruption or disaster or degradation is a one-way energy drain. Um, instead, I want to advocate for the dialectic defined for an American artist that is my hero, Robert Smithson, as he defines dialectic as seemingly contradictory forces dependent upon each other for their existence and their vitality. So for three decades, I have obsessed over working with industrial sites and cities. I have troubled over how generations who have lived and worked there can foster social and environmental health. I have scavenged for what design potential lies within these tough sites, these ugly duckling landscapes. If I find that if you can see through the blight, you can appreciate the imprints of ambitious men and women who have literally built, in our case, the American dream. And I believe, and I see in the concrete, which is maybe a little strange, their sweat that soaked into those slabs and beneath them to the embodied energy that is to me to be respected at every site. But that respect is in, difficult to engender, surprisingly. And two, I have found that two primary things seem to get into the way. One is the persistent idealized view of the landscape, the bucolic myopia that obstructs any broader view of places that are brown or bright orange, cracked or rusted. And I've always wondered when green became a verb, when people want to green things. It's a problem. Um, in turn, the second dilemma are still prevalent remediation practices that are very skin deep and quick fixes. Um, and they're, uh, you know, they're, they basically um, erase all of the site uh, memories, uh, site histories by digging up and disposing a landscape regardless of evidence of those site histories. It's like throwing out the baby with the bathwater or throwing life stories into a landfill. And I think this is where we can come in as landscape architects. We can acknowledge the boom is glorious and that the bust is painful. And we can reveal what part um, that they are part of a cycle and maybe a long, slow one. If you see these as a cycle and not just kind of a straight linear process um, as industrial or urban succession, disturbances are a crucial part of a landscape's productivity. Cyclical thinking has I rejects remediation and ops for regeneration. 
So instead of a lengthy descriptions uh, this morning, I think for you, I'll be using uh, six projects to expose three design methodologies. The emphasis here is on the verbs, catalyze, cast, and craft. Two projects that deal with the disturbance associated with coal mining is what I'm going to be showing you here with the catalyzed change. One is a coke works and, um, and a struggling town beside a lifeless creek. The other is a contaminated coke plant owned by a global corporation, both 19th century, but at either end of those centuries. The, here, the social is the social and cultural legacy of coal mining that it has a complicated relationship to a troubled landscape, namely the waterways that are polluted with acid mine drainage, or AMD. Uh, in this case, this project needed multiple design disciplines to um, deal with uh, the complexity and to catalyze this change, art, design, history, and science. Most folks were cleaning up AMD behind fences and waiting for it to go away. And we thought differently. We asked what would be the next step in the industrial process. After generations worked in these coal tunnels, tunnels which are etched in this plate, um, what if we took the next, next shift? So enter science, a passive treatment uh, system that through nat natural processes converts acid, metal laden, um, toxic liquid into biologically rich water. We wanted a demonstration project to make this transformation visible. So the Vittendale was perfect. Here's a historic photograph of an amazing broad floodplain um, contaminated, um, a struggling but present community across the creek and an adjacent what was going to be an adjacent region, regional bike path and a toxic orange creek. Our team of artists, designers, historians, and scientists took to this sculpting the floodplain in a, making a giant ecological washing machine. That's the above is that's the hydrologic sketch uh, um, of the hydrogeologists and Stacy and I interpreting the system. And here's yeah that site plan of it, which is a progression of basins we call the pH ponds. Those are number one through six there that raise the pH and the metals drop out. They precipitate. And then the wetlands are the finishing rinse that incorporate the foundations of coke ovens as a part of the story. This, this is the excavation of the big washing machine. This treatment is just a moment in time, just as the coke production was. We push the succession of this landscape, its evolution in a certain direction. Now it's awaiting its next cycle. And on the second project here, our team had a giant icon of American industry on our hands. The, and the Forge River Rouge plant, which is the first integrated manufacturing plant of the world. Uh, it was this int intense cultural context that the folks um, at Forge surprisingly, they surprisingly undervalued that, um, those values of the culture. Um, William Clayford Jr. was convinced to revitalize the historic plant, amazingly, um, versus build on a giant um, greenfield. Um, here's one of my many manic sketches, but I was very excited um, that our biggest task was to show what potential their story had to imagine its next evolution in terms of this narrative that could be told along um, Miller Road, if you see that, of the kind of evolution of, um, of the River Rouge. So with Miller Road, uh, now the broad red line turned north, you'd see that we simply organized this narrative um, in these uh, three uh, regenerative parts. But God damn it, the goddamn architect, oh, I have a, I hope, are there any architects there? No. Uh, I should say, and then, oops, uh, the architect suffered from some green fever, ignoring the grit of this working landscape. So I was like, no, no, stop. So we went back, we went down to the Coke ovens um, and argued against this bucolic delusion by looking realistically at production cycles of the Coke, Coke operations in particular, which you see on the left there where that insane flow of diagram um, 
is actually grounded by a very poignant moment when I found these clogs on the top of the Coke ovens, which were worn by the workers so that the bottom of their boots would not melt. So we did this simple, well, or maybe complicated diagram because we did our homework because they wanted to hog and haul the whole thing away. We said, no, we know it's hot and we know what's not so that we could curate this landscape and actually think about um, adding a new layer. And we actually pressured Ford to consider the regeneration of the works as part of the legacy that they should take the next shift. So, voila. Uh, this was a hard-fought, uh, hard-fought um, configuration of the remediation gardens. Actually, they call them fields because they freaked out that I called them gardens. Um, uh, but the good news is, is that you know we hauled a scientist out of the basement, and here you go. We enlisted Dr. Clayton Rue, a specialist in phytoremediation, and he set up his laboratory there. And that laboratory is right along Miller Road, and it's free and open to the public. And it's in juxtaposition with um, the remaining Coke ovens. And there's uh, uh, Clayton harvesting data that he's going, he's gone off to work with Ford on other projects. And um, the Ford got to put a little bit of a uh, feather in their cap. Note here that design, you know, as a form was not the point. Um, changing minds was the point and we changed corporate minds. The second cast a course of action. As you may have already gathered, I care less about form as I um, cherish form as a verb. Um, I believe in human agency and I also put a lot of faith into landscape processes. Um, so here is a pair of project that attempt this. One is about faith, investing in people willing to reclaim their landscape, the other about trust, respecting a landscape's emblematic urban succession. This project, um, conceived by artist Mel Chin, dared to unearth the disaster from the disaster. And what you see there is underlying, uh, underlying the, uh, the city plan is a let, a, a soil map of all the leaded soils, and on top is, of course, Katrina. Um, and perhaps it was a bit perverse on our part, but we believe that NOLA really needed to be rebuilt from below the, the ground up. All this hurry about putting shotgun houses back down, we resisted and said, no, wait, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Look at this map and notice how hot um, uh, New Orleans is. So we set about it in with two-pronged approach. Um, Operation Pay Dirt was the umbrella, and it's two parts of an action plan. Mel organized a, plan, a brilliant campaign to literally make the money um, it would take to treat the leaded, leaded soils across the city. Um, and so he spearheaded that social and cultural dimension through art. Meanwhile, Dirt was in charge of the logistics with our operation. So this is this is the um, these are the hundred dollar bill um, initiative that Mel put together, and it was an amazing project where he sent this lesson plan to children across the United States, ones that had, had left New Orleans um, uh, and and others. Um, to literally draw this money. And they actually are still making the money and they're gonna um, send it to Congress to be exchanged for real money. Then meanwhile, we needed some science again. How do you make healthy soils? And what you see here is um, the recipe of a phosphate um, amendment that converts the lead into uh, pyromorphite, which is a non-bioavailable substance. So it it basically uh, converts the lead to not be toxic anymore. Uh, to further the recipe, um, we had um, we have the uh, phosphate amendment, and then you put a layer of clean sediment to just be a kind of a safety layer, and then um, uh, trees to regrow the city's um, urban forest. The sediment, you the sediment. Where do you get that much sediment? Well, you get it from the Bonnet Carey spillway, where there is an endless supply of what the locals call sugar. Um, and 
this was the main thing, the big mud action. It was conceived as a type of social infrastructure at nested scales that operates, operates across the city. At every scale, there was an idea who would be in, involved from city agencies to local residents to all the organizations in between. So the extra large depots serve as distribution centers. They take, um, they're taking that sugar off the barges and sending truck fulls of ingredients into neighborhoods. The mud market, the mud square, took advantage of those larger abandoned parcels to set up demonstration gardens and uh, testing soils and distribute uh, with mural barrels to um, nearby neighbors. And then um, out come the rakes, and they're putting on that uh, final layer um, of, of sugar. Okay, so the high line. Okay, so... I have to admit that I am entering dangerous territory when I talk about this project. Um, I, 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 I come across, I can, I risk coming across as a sore loser of the competition. My team came in second. Um, and am I a sore loser? Damn skippy I am. Um, but many people love the High Line as it is today, which I think is bullshit. So if anyone were, were to see that landscape before it got manhandled, you might agree. By the way, that is the landscape as found in that uh, in that panorama. And this is it um, with its history, an important part of this landscape cycle um, of heroic infrastructure. And then, of course, abandoned um, infrastructure begets a landscape that began to grow. And what we what we came to love is that it was a landscape that was growing according to its own language, not ours, and into its own logic, not our logic. So really, all we wanted to do was acknowledge that. And all we wanted to do was that. Our team was in trouble from the start since we made a pact to work on the, with the High Line as it existed. We argued for a resourceful means to cultivate this urban wild. Instead, the High Line has gone through that overhaul. It's really hard to explain and show succession, to ask people to have faith and chance. We were, we were seeking to foster an understanding about a, a potential loop a loop that entangles environmental change and human interaction. We wanted to show that changes in the landscape those, um, and to realize that if we are smart, we can go with their flow. And to keep it simple, let people meander and notice things around them. Do all you can to respect this landscape. Or you can let the landscape do this. It's another type of succession. Some people might call Disneyland. And in preparing this lecture, it was interesting that I found this sketch of mine from 15 years ago. Okay, last piece, craft a way to reset. So now it may appear that I'm going to be contradicting myself if I show you a couple of form-filled projects, but the methodology I'm describing is directed at form that emerges from a site, not a form that descends. Forms are completely dependent on what is found. Finding is the primary act of design in these two projects. This is the site of a historic baby yard with half of it still operating as a shipyard. Um, and the next evolution of what you see highlighted there for the historic core was another era of production. And in this case, a, um, a campus for the retailer, Urban Outfitters. In the case of Urban Outfitters, or just urban for short, the cycles of production have gone for, from life jackets to halter tops. It's still a sublime landscape with some battleships docked in the fleet basin. So it made me wonder again, what, what happened on the left? What happened to 
the architect thinking that he should just green the Navy Yard. Um, I find it disrespectful. <laughs> um, and instead, I um, opt on the right there. This is us working with the founder of Urban to come up with an action plan, a messy one, but still has an armature. It has an armature based on the lines of production that were there with the Navy. Um, and if you can, uh, what I always look for are the very, very yummy things like rail lines. So off you go to the site and you're like, holy cow, where is everything? And if you look closely at this, you'll see an archway, an arc, a bit, one of those beautiful railroad curves going into that space. For me, this is when you look hard like this, this, the, this, the site um, uh, designs itself. So all you have to do for the next thing is you reuse some of the concrete debris, having it lovingly put into place. It's, called, it's nicknamed Barney Rubble. And then add a little feminine touch. We put um, cherries on top. In another case, we let... Uh, we did a bit of a fast forwarding of succession with plants that were going to colonize there anyway. And in many cases, we let the landscape go um, to register all of the uh, all of the seasons. And in the case of uh, the next slide, uh, in this case, you know, I, I look at this and I'm like, well, I you couldn't design this, but you certainly want to take credit for it. Pretty beautiful. So let's talk about rubble, as difficult as that might be there. Um, I love it because of its embodied energy of human agency. And I'm proud to say that in this project, we reused about 90% of the concrete, asphalt, and brick. We brought it to the next phase of the project, which is the giant historic dock, uh, dry dock number one. And it, um, the, the, the head of that dock, next, next slide, um, was uh, under two inches of asphalt. We uncovered this beautiful crisscross um, of rail lines that, again, all it needed was, with the next slide, the, si the, the, the space designed itself. We just extruded, extruded these curves of recycled steel, and then we packed it with amber waves of grasses. And in this one, we, you get to watch how groovy the urbanites zigzag through it and how it can become a runway. In the case of the dry dock, we tried really hard to not have this be a privatized landscape, but a public magnet. And indeed, it has become that. Folks at Urban have said to me that they feel that the landscape has always been there that they are part of what's next. Okay, last project here. Takes us to another post-industrial city, Detroit. Uh, there I'm looking to find the latent beauty of abandoned landscapes in a fallow city. And by fallow, I don't mean destitute. Indeed, I mean dormant and full of seeds ready to sprout. In Core City neighborhood, a young developer is doing incredible things with one and two story industrial buildings. Um, those are the size industries being the most prevalent embedded in the, in the neighborhoods. Um, here, the site is bounded on three sides um, by one and two story buildings and underneath its history of a firehouse. When I first met um, Philip, very first time, uh, he asked me, what would you do with this space? I blurted out, I would pack the entire space with trees. And that was really kind of a weird instinct. But then he asked, what would you do about the ground? And I simply said, dig. I had the hunch that the demolished firehouse got pushed into the basement. And my dumb luck, luck we struck gold. Here you see Philip and I looking at the, you know, uh, lime green lines where we were um, arranging islands that would be in the grove. Uh, in an old driveway, we smashed out uh, paving to plant. Um, and in a lot of ways, really all we did was find the surface. 
and um, compl all imprinted with time and full of energy. I feel like this locust was asking who was first at this party. And all the pieces that we brought up, including the cornerstone you see there, were laid on the ground. They weren't memorialized. They were not fetishized. They were simply put back to work. The park is in fact proving to be a magnet for the neighborhood as well as for the city. I have watched people in the park and suspect that they know them, they, that they themselves are the new layer, the next cycle of this landscape. All I did there was help push a reset button. Now the optimism in and of that landscape is palpable. As difficult as these landscapes are to face, here is our opportunity as a discipline. City planners and architects are all saying that it, take, it will take robust landscape strategies to address the volatile processes that result in abandoned land. And not necessarily for redevelopment, but for new types of resourceful landscapes. Creating these landscapes will take a new way of working, of deploying design as finding, respecting, curating, and recasting, and resetting disruption as productive disturbance, as a dynamic dialectic within the successional city. My answer to disruption, the landscape is clocking in for the next shift. Thank you.